السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن حبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما فقد قال ربنا رب العرش العظيم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون صدق الله صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسوله الكريم صلى الله عليه وسلم وقال نبي الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الإسلام بدأ غريب وسيعود غريب فطوب للغرباء أما بعد فرب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي So subhanallah you know we live in a time that really is categorized by mass confusion. You know, there's a lot of pushes, there's a lot of pulls. Most of the time, people don't really know what they believe. And when they do, and when you push them on it, a lot of subjectivity, a lot of isms, ideologies, theories, that they don't really know how to explain very well. You know, many, many experts might have assumed, right? that open access to information that we have in the modern world, internet, sources, etc., etc., would have led to somebody being more well-rounded intellectually. But really what we've seen is that when you give people information and access to that information, but you don't give them a methodology upon which they can criticize what is wrong and accept what is right, what happens? Confusion, uncertainty. You know, subhanAllah, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about the Qur'an when he mentions the Qur'an? Haqqun yaqeen, a certain truth, objective, clear. You know, a story that, or experience that I have that really encapsulates this. I gave a khutbah at UGA a couple of years ago. And you know, a lot of people that know me, I'm not a very serious person. I make a lot of jokes, very aloof kind of personality, right? So a sister came up to me after the salah and she said, uh, Man, I have a quick question. So I'm kind of joking around, I'm like, wait, what's up? Said, what's the problem? She tells me, I'm having doubts in Islam. So suddenly I have to get serious now. I say, no, Alim, this is something serious now. Somebody's saying they have doubts in Islam, right? So we go to the side real quick, ask, what's, what's going on? You know, this is the important question, why? Why? Right? She said, I'm having doubts in Islam because I'm problematizing, problematizing, right? Hijab. Hijab. So a secondary aspect of the religion, she's saying, I'm having trouble believing in Islam because of this. So really most people, what would they do? They would immediately go to, let's explain why hijab is actually something good, which is a good approach. True, something that is obligatory in the religion, something that is a beautiful practice, right? 
But I could sense that in this question, there was something else we had to discuss first, right? So I begin by saying, not giving an answer as to why hijab is correct and a good practice, but rather, why are you seeing hijab as a problem? What about hijab is causing this issue and this friction? You know, we get to talking, there's a certain, you know, very popular theory that's being discussed, and he doesn't believe it's moral, fair, equitable, etc., etc., etc. So that goes to the first part of the question. We need to speak about the fundamental. If that's the issue, why would it be immoral? Why would it be not fair? Why would it not be equitable? Right? So we begin with the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we go through basic kanam argument, you know, necessary contingent things, why it's logically necessary for someone to believe in a creator. At the end of it, do you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes. Okay, play you. One aspect for you. Then we go into the Nabuwa of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet of of the Prophet. We talk about the miraculous life, the events, etc., etc. Do you believe in the Prophet of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Yes, MashaAllah. Then we go to the third point. Do you believe in the preservation of the Quran? Go through the Asanid, the chain, the narrators, how it was preserved to this day, memorization, etc. Do you accept the Quran is preserved? Yes. Okay. And similarly, from an epistemological perspective, the same narrator that preserved the Quran preserved the Hadith and the Sunnah. So do you accept this part of the religion as well? Yes. This is Islam. This is what we call normative Sunni Islam. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The five pillars of Islam. The six pillars of Iman. And then the juristic tradition that comes out of that. Right? So if you find a secondary aspect, and when I say secondary, not in the sense that hijab is not important, but secondary in the sense that if a non-Muslim came to you and said, why are you Muslim? Would you say because the women in our religion cover their hair? No, it would be those previous points. Belief in Allah believe in the Prophet those accompanying underlying theological assumptions that come with that, right? So when somebody has that secondary issue in their religion, a juristic issue, whatever that might be, any aspect of fiqh, of aqidah, some issue of history that they don't, they think doesn't jive well with the modern environment, right? The key is to what? To go back to those foundational premises. Because those foundational premises, when you accept them, when you accept that there's an omnipotent Lord that revealed these things, that knows us so well and loves us so much that he explained to us what is right and what is wrong for us, then everything that comes after is a secondary conclusion and is accepted. And then we go into what? Na'illa, the reason behind it. But first, we accept it. Why? Because we have those foundational elements. You know? Explain it's like you have a building. And this building, essential building, it's a beautiful building, 120 stories, great nafa, great benefit to it. The foundation is strong, the structure is strong. Everyone accepts that this building will last until Yom al Qiyamah, right? But on the 110th floor, you don't quite understand the electrical framework of it, right? The light fixtures won't turn on, it's really confusing, it's really difficult. What do you do with, at that point? Do you say, khalas, this, this building is useless, I have no nafa? No. It's let's go to the source of that issue. Let's hire some electricians, some contractors, try to figure out what we can do to better understand that aspect of it, right? But we wouldn't just throw the whole thing away and say it has no benefit. And this is really the key for us, is that unfortunately there's many issues in the modern world where we might see, see or think that some modern subjective idea doesn't jive well with Islam. But again, what's the key? Go back to the foundation. Go back to those premises. In SubhanAllah, we always think that our experiences are very unique. And, you know, and everybody feels this way, for some reason or the other. But one of the beautiful aspects of this religion of ours is not just the preservation of the life of Muhammad Sallallahu our Prophet, and the preservation of our books, but also the preservation of the lives of the companions of the Prophet Because interesting, interestingly enough, many of us, we might assume, you know, it's hard to sometimes empathize with the life of the Prophet because he was ma'asum, he was infallible. How can we relate to that? But we can relate to the Sahaba because they were his companions, his followers, they were ordinary people. They could make mistakes, they could be right, they could be wrong. Right? So there's a very important event in Islamic history called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. We're going over this, we don't have too much time to explain the details of it, but essentially what happens is the Prophet he has a dream. Now, in this dream, 
he sees that him and his followers are making pilgrimage to Mecca. And of course, as we all know, the dreams of the prophets, it's a type of wahi, it's a type of revelation. So the Sahaba and the Prophet, they get ready for a great pilgrimage, right? Right when they get to the outskirts of Mecca, the Quraysh stops them. And they tell them, we can't accept, you know, there, there was a lot of skirmishes back and forth for a very long time at that point, right? So they refused to allow them entry. Now the Sahaba didn't know what to do at this point. Nobody knew what to do at this point. Eventually, the Prophet ﷺ decides to have a treaty with the Quraysh. Where we're going to turn back, we're not going to make pilgrimage this year, but we want a 10 year truce, so for 10 years there will be no fighting. And on top of that, we can give open da'wah to the Arabs of the surrounding areas without persecution. Interesting, right? When Sayyidina Umar he hears this, he gets upset. He responds to the Prophet, he has a small dissent, and he says, Are we not upon the truth, Ya Rasulullah? We know that you've seen this dream. We know that it's revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How could we? How could we go back on this? Right? And by the way, as a secondary point, there's some people that try to make this as a point of attack in Sayyidina Umar, right? This really isn't an element of bad character. This dissent, when we talk about this, one of the beautiful elements of the Prophet ﷺ is that he would always engage in shura with his companions. He would always consult with his companions. Even when he knew, even when he knew what the correct course of action was, he did what? He consulted with the companions to make them feel involved, to make them feel engaged. SubhanAllah, how many of us don't do this? But the Prophet ﷺ, upon which, what does Allah say? وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَلَيْ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا Every action he had was guided. And even with that knowledge, he still consulted with his peers to make them feel engaged, to make them feel welcome. Right? So there was times when the Sahaba thought that there, there could be an element of discussion about something. Right? Sayyidina Umar starts discussing. So again, this is just a discussion. It gets to a point where Sayyidina Abu Bakr actually grabs Sayyidina Umar and tells him, look, I think you've taken this too far. The decision has been made. We go on with it. Right? Anyways, later in the day, Sayyidina Umar starts feeling a little bad because he feels like he might have been a little bit not disrespectful, but he dissented in front of the people, the Prophet ﷺ, right? He couldn't have seen, he couldn't have foreseen why that was a good decision. And why was that? Why did he dissent? You know, there's two primary reasons that we can say that Umar ﷺ dissented. Number one, the social norms and customs of the time. So at that time, the haram was such a place that even tribes at war, even somebody that was guilty of committing murder, they were allowed to go make pilgrimage. It was such an important social norm, a social behavior, that was widely accepted. So when that was, what? Declined or rejected, it caused that clash. And how many of us see the same thing? Normative beliefs that we feel might clash with Islam. Same situation. 1400 years ago. And secondary, say the shaks, you know, the kind of person that Sayyidina Umar was, you know, he wasn't somebody that took disrespect very lightly like that. And it was a very disrespectful occasion. Sayyidina Umar was the one who did what? When he made pilgrimage and the Muslims were systematically robbed and pillaged, he told the people of Quraysh, he went in front of the Kaaba, he said, I'm making pilgrimage or I'm making hijrah to Medina tomorrow. Anybody that wants their Wives, widowed, children, orphaned, come meet me. This is, he was somebody that was very, very strong, very, not arrogant, but very powerful in his beliefs, right? So when he knew something was right, or when he knew something he thought was right, he refused to budge on it, right? What was the beauty of Hudaybiyah that the Sahaba couldn't see at that time? By giving the Muslims this 10 year truce and allowing them to give da'wah to the surrounding Arabs, by the time the Quraysh inevitably broke that truce several years later, the Muslims had enough people from the surrounding areas to what? To conquer Mecca in a bloodless conquest. No fighting, no war. But nobody could have seen that coming. It was impossible to see in the future. And Sayyidina Umar later said, several years later when he was a Khalifa, on that day in Hudaybiyah, we learned to never question the wisdom and the foresight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. And we're in the same position. We're in the same position where there's certain things that we might feel are in conflict with what is largely considered to be subjectively true. But the key to this is what? Go back to the foundational premise, as I've said three or four times. 
And you know, so kind of love, when it comes to issues like this, really what we have to come back to is the idea that the wisdom of Islam, the wisdom of the teachings of Islam, they're timeless, they're eternal. They're not bound to a specific time period. They don't change. You know, here, when we say something is subjective, it means that in 20, 30, 40 years, it can change. Three or four people will discuss an issue, it can change. Four or five years later, it changes. 10 years later, it changes. But in our belief system, when we say something comes from an omnipotent creator, there was a creator, Allah Azza wa Jal, that knew us so well that he gave us eternal truths. So if we don't know something, what do we do? Allah Subh'ala says, أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ If you don't know something, if something you feel is problematic, take that up with somebody who you feel is qualified to answer that. Discuss it, engage in it. How many of us, you know, when we're researching perfect bench press form, when we're researching soccer statistics, when we're researching sports, etc., we spend hours, hours, hours researching these things, but we can't ask one simple question when we feel like we might have a conflicting idea? And to the parents of the community as well, and people that are in positions of power, never react badly to a question. Never react badly to it. There is no question that is too aib. The Sahaba, if you go through the, que the, the questions the Sahaba asked, they asked an immense amount of things. Some things people think are inappropriate, some things people think are trivial, some things people think are ridiculous, right? But they asked it because they wanted to know the answers. You do somebody a great disservice and a great oppression when they ask you a question and you react badly. Nobody can grow like that. Nobody can grow like that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to have the proper adab in asking and answer questions, answering questions. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to alleviate our doubts by studying the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to research our religion effectively and answer questions when they come. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون فقد قال ربنا رب رب العرش العظيم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على بدر التمام ومصباح الظلام ومفتاح دار السلام وشمس دين الإسلام محمد عليه الصلاة والسلام ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب رب طاهر قلوبنا من النفاق وأعمالنا من الرياء وأدسنتنا من الكذب وأعيننا من الخيانة فإنك تعلم خائنة الأعين وما تخفي صدور اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أنصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أشفي مرضانا ومغوى المسلمين اللهم أجرنا من النار اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة اللهم أغفر لنا وأرحمنا يا أرحم الراحمين فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار إن الله يأمر, يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعدكم لعلكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون فقيموا إلى صلاة الجنة الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين ألم تر أن الفلك تجري في البحر بنعمة الله ليريكم من آياته إن في ذلك لآيات لكل صبار شكور وإذا غشيهم موج كالظلل دعوا الله مخلصين له الدين دعوا الله مخلصين له الدين فلما نجاهم فلما نجاهم إلى البر فمنهم مقتصد وما يجحد بآياتنا إلا كل ختار كفور يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم واخشوا يوما واخشوا يوما لا يجزي والد عن ولده ولا مولود ولا مولود هو جاز عن والده شيئا إن وعد الله حق فلا تغرنكم الحياة الدنيا ولا يغرنكم ولا يغرنكم بالله الغرور إن وينزل الغيث ويعلم ما في الأرحام وما تدري نفس ماذا تكسب غدا وما تدري نفس بأي أرض تموت إن الله عليم خبير الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى الله سمع الله لمن حمده 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة Please keep all of our community in your prayers, inshallah. May Allah 